Right. Hello, everyone. So my name is Ronice Owens, and we are pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture in volume seven of our The No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. The series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of the No Neuropsychology Board, as well as members of our rotating committee. We would like to thank our 2023 sponsors for their generous financial support of this series. And before we start, one of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free, high quality didactic content to our audience. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures to get first access to new content. New to No Neuropsychology is our collaboration with Absin to bring you learning and discussion questions that are provided with specific lecture content. You can access these on our website and through Absin. No Neuropsychology is also excited to announce that transcripts are now available for all lectures in volumes one and two. Additional transcripts will be added over time. And so here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maureen O'Connor for today's lecture titled, Caring for the Dementia Caregiver. Dr. O'Connor graduated with a bachelor's degree from Ithaca College, where she majored in both psychology and religion. She received her doctorate in psychology from Indiana University of Pennsylvania focusing her dissertation on the differentiation of depression versus Alzheimer's disease. She had attended Yale University School of Medicine for her predoctoral internship, where she conducted outpatient and inpatient memory evaluations for adults with a broad range of diagnostic presentations, including dementia, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. She went on to complete one year of postdoctoral residency at Cornell Well Medical Center, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and two additional years of residency at the Bedford VA Hospital, Boston University School of Medicine. In 2005, she accepted an appointment at the Bedford VA Hospital as a Director of Neuropsychology. In that role, she established the Memory Diagnostic Clinic at the Bedford VA Hospital, specifically designed to evaluate and treat older veterans with memory loss. In 2008, she was awarded board certification in neuropsychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. In 2009, she accepted the Young Alumni Achievement Award from the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. She has served on the board of the Massachusetts Neuropsychological Society and the National Academy of Neuropsychology. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine and the director of the research education component at Boston University in the Alzheimer's Disease Center. Dr. O'Connor's research interests include understanding and developing interventions to improve the lives of adults with memory loss and the lives of the family members that help provide care. Most recently, the National Institute of Health and National Institute of Aging provided Dr. O'Connor and colleagues with $3.2 million of funding to support five-year research project, examining how relationship factors impact couples navigating a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. In addition to her ongoing research activities, Dr. O'Connor continues to evaluate and treat individuals with memory loss while teaching doctoral students, interns, and residents in neuropsychology. And in her free time, she enjoys running, cooking, and relaxing with her family 
and their family dog, Bruce. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. O'Kyer. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me here. Everybody um, always laughs that Bruce is the only one that has a name when people uh, introduce, introduce my family. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, just give me a moment. Okay, so um, uh, I am gonna be presenting some information uh, to help us uh, care for our dementia caregivers. I do most of my clinical work within the VA system. So for those of you that are within a VA system, I'll be providing a lot of references specific to caring for our veteran caregivers and our caregivers of veterans. Uh, much of that information is also publicly available. So I think it's very relevant to folks that are outside of a VA system. And then of course, I'll be um, providing all sorts of other um, references and, and uh, hopefully things that can be helpful to, to everybody in their in their practices. Um, I think, you know, as neuropsychologists, for many of us, the most contact we have with families and dementia caregivers occurs when we see patients in our clinics for evaluation and again at feedback. So uh, much of the information that I'll be presenting, I think can be useful to incorporating into reports and feedback sessions. Uh, in other settings, we may have opportunities to work directly with dementia caregivers. Uh, and here at the VA, we run a, a suite of dementia caregiver services. And so for those of you that may be in areas where you're doing direct work with dementia caregivers or are interested in beginning to do uh, more direct work with dementia caregivers, I think uh, this information will, will be useful. So this is our outline. Um, I'm going to try to get through uh, an awful lot in a, a short period of time. So um, I apologize if I'm, I'm talking quickly. Uh, we'll go through an overview and then we'll talk about some of these areas relevant to uh, caring for our dementia caregivers. So I'm going to start by providing two composite caregivers that, um, you know, are, are no uh, specific individual, but I, I think are very representative of the uh, typical types of uh, caregiver situations that, that we run into. Uh, so Joan is a 47-year-old married working mother of two. She has two boys, 11 and 7. She's an administrative assistant to a large medical practice and is still working a 40-hour work week. She is the primary caregiver for her father, who has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. He was diagnosed about four years prior to us working with her. Uh, he presents with some cognitive decline, becomes confused about who she is at some visits, um, is repetitive. Uh, she finds that he's difficult to get out of bed on occasion, and she worries that he's depressed. He refuses to go to uh, daycare or, or any sort of activities outside the home. Uh, she also has concerns about guns in his home. She lives about 20 minutes from her father's house, but tries to visit him daily. She helps with medication management, um, filling his pillbox, providing uh, reminders by calling him, uh, making sure that he's taking his medications, uh, goes grocery shopping for him, helps him to manage appointments uh, and his finances. Her parents divorced when she was seven. Uh, her father has a past history of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and alcohol abuse with one prior suicide attempt. Her father was uh, physically abusive to both she and her brother when they were younger and was largely absent throughout her childhood following the divorce. Uh, her and her father re-engaged when she was in college after he became sober, and she has an older brother that lives several states away, uh, but is not involved in their father's care uh, at all. And then this is Donald. So Donald is an 82-year-old former Army veteran. Uh, he's been married 56 years to uh, a woman that he describes as his soulmate. Uh, they have two adult children that live out of state. He is the primary caregiver for his wife, uh, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease nine years prior. She has cognitive decline, uh, and um, he's most bothered by personality changes. Uh, he describes her as being aggressive and mean, uh, and this is a, a, a in stark contrast to her premorbid personality. She's had some significant weight gain and declines in self-care and can become combative around taking medications and bathing. 
He has a lot of sadness over the loss of their relationship, uh, the fact that they can't do activities they used to enjoy together. He himself has a history of PTSD and depression, has been in treatment in the past, but not in the last 15 years, and he did find his previous treatment helpful. He endorses uh, current depressed mood. They have a visiting nurse that comes to the home four times a week to help his wife dress and bathe and do some light housework. And his children have really been urging him to consider a higher level of care outside the home, but he is very reluctant to do that. Uh, so I want us to keep these two caregivers in mind as, as we go through some of this material. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease truly is a, a disease of families. 83% uh, of help provided to older adults in the U.S. comes from informal, untrained, unpaid caregivers. And in uh, uh, 2021, the work that our caregivers was, were doing was valued at $271.6 billion, higher than the 2021 annual revenue of Google, to put that in perspective. And when caregivers are asked why they provide care, they give uh, typically three primary reasons. The first is a desire to keep the individual with dementia at home. Uh, so 65% of seniors report that they want to age in place, and their caregivers often feel a desire to abide by those wish wishes. Uh, there's also the desire to remain close to the individual with dementia. And I think that this can be a particularly salient factor for more rural dementia caregivers who may have a nearest placement for their loved one outside the home that is uh, much further away from, from where they are. Uh, and then also a uh, perceived obligation. So, so who are these folks? Who are our dementia caregivers? About 34% are age 65 and older themselves. So they might be dealing with their own health issues or uh, you know, cognitive concerns. Uh, two out of three caregivers are women. 25% are part of this sandwich generation of caregivers. So these are caregivers that are caring uh, both for uh, an elder uh, adult with dementia, but also for young children. And it's estimated that 250,000 children and young adults between the ages of 8 and 18 provide help to someone with dementia. Uh, and we'll sort of circle back to that a little bit. 66% of caregivers live with the individual with dementia. 40% have at least a college degree. 60% are employed while providing care. And 41% say that nobody else helps them to provide uh, care. So just going back for a moment to those 250,000 children and teens that may help provide care or you know, may just be living with the person with memory loss or even just being a part of a family that's dealing with the disease. Um, these are some children's books that I often recommend to help explain memory loss and dementia. Uh, there are many more. I would recommend doing a Google search to add to your toolbox of recommendations that you have uh, available for families. And then the Alzheimer's Association also has a free parent's guide for helping children and teens understand dementia. So these are uh, some additional resources for, for your families and those kids. So uh, again, 60% of caregivers are employed while providing care, and caregiving has some significant impacts on uh, work performance and status, which given the economic burden on families, really combines to present a real stress to the individual caregiver uh, and to the family system. And at the lifetime cost of caring for someone with dementia, 70% of that is borne uh, directly by, by the families. Uh, I'll orient you to this slide. So this slide uh, really illustrates some of the problems that uh, caregivers broadly, uh, uh, but then uh, also dementia caregivers have in the workplace. So the purple bars represent our dementia caregivers. Uh, the teal bars represent caregivers of other persons. And you can see that for most of these areas, our dementia caregivers are, are faring worse. Uh, so, so these uh, occupational changes include things like having to go in late or leave early or take time off to provide care, uh, having to reduce hours from full-time to part-time, taking a leave of absence, having to give up work entirely, uh, turning down the promotion because uh, one realizes that they can't care for their loved one and also take on additional uh, higher responsibilities at work, 
receiving a warning about performance and attendance, losing benefits, and retiring early. So pretty significant impacts in the workplace. When caregivers are asked what they do to help care for their loved one, they say, you know, whatever I have to, whatever it takes. And this includes helping with instrumental activities of daily living, like shopping and meal prep and arranging and uh, transporting their loved one to appointments, managing finances, uh, basic activities of daily living, like helping with bathing and dressing and grooming when it reaches that point, uh, but also things like providing physical care, including things like transferring their loved one in and out of bed or in and out of chairs and wheelchairs. Uh, helping to manage symptoms, helping the person adhere to treatment recommendations, helping to manage behavioral symptoms, uh, helping to find and utilize support services, or hiring and supervising other people that are coming into the home to provide uh, care, managing other health conditions, uh, and then of course providing emotional support, just being there for the person, providing a sense of security, uh, helping to communicate between family members, and the support that dementia caregivers provide uh, doesn't stop when and if the individual enters a higher level of care outside the home. Typically, dementia caregivers report continuing to, to provide uh, some form of care. And this may sort of shift. It may be more focused on providing emotional support uh, or interacting with facility staff, uh, advocating for appropriate care, uh, but many caregivers report continuing to help with instrumental and basic activities of daily living, even when their loved one is outside the home. So we know that there are uh, many uh, negative consequences of caregiving, uh, both physical and emotional consequences. Our caregivers report being uh, highly, highly stressed. Uh, they suffer from depression, anxiety. They may uh, delay their own health care, even though they're highly worried about their own health care. Uh, and I'm quite uh, sort of interested in this topic of a caregiver career. So um, this is the transition from when an individual begins to think of themselves as a caregiver to the end of that role. And we know from clinical experience that defining oneself as a caregiver differs from person to person. So uh, some people come into the clinic and refer to themselves as a caregiver when their loved one is in a stage that we might define as mild cognitive impairment. Other people come in and do not refer to themselves as a caregiver, even though the person uh, that they're with uh, is requiring a, a lot of additional support. Uh, so, you know, there isn't much research on the, the transition uh, into when, you know, one begins defining themselves as a, a caregiver. Uh, my colleagues and I at the BUADRC are currently collecting some data to try to understand this transition a little bit more and the impact the transition might have on caregivers uh, and also their person with dementia. So, you know, hopefully I'll have some more to say uh, about that at a later time, uh, but there's not, there's not much uh, out there right now. Um, there are also many changes over the course of this caregiving career as disease and symptoms change and progress over time. And then the career comes to a close with the passing of the loved one. And you know that in and of itself requires yet a, another transition. Uh, I do wanna mention some of the literature on caregiving and COVID-19. Uh, so certainly we can all appreciate that COVID-19 and associated protective measures, including you know, stay at home orders, reduced both outside support and support coming into the home. Caregivers uh, reported having increased care responsibilities, decreased emotional support, um, decreases in their mental and physical health, and increases in their burden. Uh, caregivers during this time have also reported that their person with dementia got cognitively worse and behaviorally worse. And there may be a couple of reasons for this. Uh, likely, it's a combination of normal disease progression over time, uh, perhaps, you know, also more time that they were spending with their loved one to notice changes, but also uh, a consequence of the removal of services that promoted health and well-being for the person with dementia. Uh, and those include, you know, daycare services, services that promote, you know, physical activity and socialization, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, the research uh, during COVID-19 on dementia caregiving did find some protective factors for caregivers, including things like higher levels of education, living with another adult in the home, you know, presumably somebody that can share some of the care responsibilities, um, being a, a male caregiver, which seems consistent with the broader literature on dementia caregiver care, caregiving, and uh, caregivers also uh, acknowledge the need for technology-based solutions, uh, so referred to in this one article as a necessary digital revolution, which uh, I think for many of us is a positive outcome uh, of COVID-19, really highlighting the benefit of technology, not just during this time, but really for, for all care, uh, caregivers that have some barriers to accessing uh, in-person care. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention a project that my group at BU did with our colleagues at NYU during the pandemic. Uh, we conducted some in-depth interviews with a very small sample of dementia caregivers living in New York City, which uh, you may recall was an early epicenter of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and so just to acknowledge uh, some limitations, a, a major limitation of the project was uh, the small sample, but also uh, the quite homogenous sample. Uh, and, you know, that said, we definitely heard some things that we knew already, like difficulty losing supports, the uh, pros and cons that caregivers felt about being isolated with their loved one with dementia. Uh, all of these folks were living with their person with dementia. Uh, so some caregivers felt like they, you know, were, were appreciative of that time. They were able to spend more time with their loved one. Uh, other caregivers uh, really noted that, you know, they didn't want to spend that much time with their loved one. They really needed respite that they weren't able uh, to get. Um, we also uh, heard from caregivers about the importance in their life of telehealth services, uh, video and phone visits with family, how for many, uh, those were good changes, that they actually reported more time seeing and speaking to their kids and their grandkids, uh, being able to participate via video in family gatherings that they couldn't have uh, otherwise. So, you know, all things um, hopefully that, that we will be able to, to keep going. Um, two things that really stuck out to me as new, things I felt I learned from this project. Uh, one was how much the differences in pandemic perception between the caregiver and the person with dementia contributed to additional burden and stress. So, you know, caregivers would say things like, you know, he can't even remember that there's a pandemic. I have to tell him, you know, every day uh, that, you know, that there's this, you know, pandemic and he looks at me like I'm crazy. Uh, or, you know, that they can't take their loved one out of the house because, you know, he'll remove his mask or she'll, uh, you know, get close to other people and forget to, to socially distance. But I think also just this experience of being in such a radically scary and unusual time and not being able to have a shared experience of that with perhaps the only person uh, that uh, the caregiver was living with uh, and had daily contact with. The second thing I learned was that a number of caregivers really expressed feeling relieved not to have to try to keep up with the pace of doing life as usual. Uh, and again, this is in New York City. So, you know, things like, you know, going to museums, going out to dinner, going to the theater, to movies, uh, that that had been something that they had been uh, trying to continue to do in some way and felt uh, very relieved that they, they just didn't have to deal with trying to figure out how to continue to have uh, those things, uh, those things happening, um, which, you know, I, I think was salient to me in particular, because prior to these interviews, I, I found myself often working with caregivers to brainstorm how they could keep up with, uh, with these activities. Uh, and I think I came to appreciate that uh, sometimes uh, permission to just not keep up with these activities is uh, the most helpful thing. Uh, so I'm not gonna say much about this. These are some of the dementia caregiver services we have uh, here, here at Bedford. Um, so, so when we uh, speak with caregivers, work with caregivers, we talk about uh, first and foremost, the importance of building a care team. Uh, 
So uh, a care team starts with the caregiver, but you know, really no one can provide care alone. So it's important to impress upon our caregivers that they need to, to ask for help. And um, you know, our caregivers are often so focused on taking good care of their loved ones that they neglect their own care. We know from the literature that caregivers delay their own care, skip their own care, even while they're taking very good care uh, of their loved one. So, so I, I really like this saying, I tell caregivers, you can't pour from an empty cup. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to provide the best care that you can to your loved one. And I think that this, you know, really seems to resonate with caregivers because it, it becomes another, caring for themselves becomes a, another way of, uh, of them um, being able to, another way that they can care for their loved one uh, better. Uh, and so, you know, it, it really, it sort of becomes another way to care, care for others. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a caregiver and he said, oh, yeah, you know, someone told me unless I put on my own oxygen mask, uh, if the flight gets rough, I won't be able to help anyone else with theirs. Um, and I thought that that was another, uh, another great analogy that uh, I told him I would be, I would be using. So, you know, how do we help our caregivers fill, fill their cups? Uh, we, you know, we talk about the importance of staying healthy, all, all of the same things that we tell our patients. Uh, we talk about, you know, the importance of making time for themselves, you know, time to engage in enjoyable activities, time to socialize. Uh, we also talk about trying to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. So we know from the literature that the majority of caregivers, when asked, can articulate positive aspects of providing care, uh, and that those caregivers that report more positive aspects of caregiving also report less burden and less strain. So, you know, trying to help our caregivers be intentional in looking for any positives in their situation, uh, cultivating this gratitude uh, can, can be a helpful intervention. Um, also, you know, helping our caregivers learn to manage their emotions. And so, you know, again, depending on the setting that you're in, this may look different. Uh, you know, certainly during interviews and feedback sessions, just listening carefully to what our caregivers are telling us, uh, taking the temperature of their mood and how they're doing. Uh, we may, in certain settings, offer in-office uh, in screens for things like depression and anxiety, and certainly making sure that we provide uh, referrals to resources as needed. And then lastly, this concept of, you know, it takes a village building, building a care team. Uh, and so, you know, we talk about, you know, the care team starting with, with the person, uh, but it's also a partnership between the patient, the caregiver, and, and treating providers. Uh, I think one huge way that we can be of value is helping family members to get on the same page about what's going on uh, with the person with dementia. So sometimes our initial feedback might be with just the patient and their primary caregiver, but considering offering a second feedback session that includes more family uh, considering a feedback session by video or phone to reach out of state family members or make it easier for family with conflicting schedules to attend. Uh, this can all be uh, very, very helpful, helping to get family on, on the same page uh, about what's going on. Um, depending on the setting we're in, we may spend more time helping our caregivers to build their team with family and friends, uh, helping them to make a list of who they might be able to turn to to request support from. Uh, we do talk with our caregivers about how helpful it is to be explicit about their needs, uh, to think about, you know, exactly what is it that would be helpful, and then also to think about small requests, because it's often easiest for the caregiver to approach someone with a small request. And if you approach a number of people with small requests, that can really add up to a big uh, relief of burden. You know, things like um, picking up medications when uh, a family member is running to the store uh, to get their own medications, uh, asking a neighbor if they might help mow the lawn, uh, asking a friend to come over and go for a walk with the person with dementia or visit the person with dementia uh, to provide a, a little bit of respite. Uh, neighbors can be a useful part of the care team, uh, particularly for caregivers caring from afar, so they can serve as an extra pair of eyes, they might be able to visit or run errands around town, 
uh, they might be in a position to watch the person with dementia if they're out locally and intervene, if they, you know, run into them at the local grocery store and see that the person is struggling, they might be able to uh, help. Uh, they may be able to do check-ins for, again, caregivers that are, are caring for afar. And then, of course, all of our uh, sort of support groups and professional caregiver uh, recommendations, national and, and community organizations are part of our caregivers care team. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that the relationship between a caregiver and the person with dementia long predates the diagnosis of dementia. So, uh, you know, people are caring for their mothers and fathers. These are daughters and sons, spouses, siblings. And also that these can be very strong relationships or uh, positive relationships or relationships that had challenges like, uh, like Joan. Uh, and, you know, we see this in our offices all the time, these dynamics that play out between family members. Uh, they can impact the dynamics of caregiving. So for Joan, she was caring for a person that she felt had never really cared for her at a point in her life when they should have. And what does that mean for her role? Uh, in working with Joan, uh, she also shared that she was really triggered when her father would forget who she was. Uh, you know, was it because he didn't care? He didn't love her? She sort of felt forgotten, like she had felt as a, a kid. Did it reflect something, you know, deficient about her? Uh, so a lot of our caregivers can, can have complicated feelings, anger, guilt, grief, relived trauma. Uh, for Donald, he felt like he was losing his best friend and working with him talked about how PTSD made it hard for him to connect with others. And his wife had really been both his closest friend and also the uh, organizer for all their social and, and family activities. So it's important to think about how we can help caregivers heal how we can help them maintain or uh, in some cases create relationships with the person that they're caring for in the context of that person's diminished abilities. It can be very important for both the caregiver and the person with dementia to try to find ways to find joy and meaning in their, in their relationships to stay as connected as they uh, can be. And uh, I believe that there can be continued meaning in these relationships even, even later in the disease uh, stage. So, so when we work with caregivers, uh, first, we really um, acknowledge that families need to prepare for relationship change. And part of that is, is to normalize uh, relationship change. So relationships are always fluid. Uh, you know, people uh, may, for example, move from a a dating relationship to a more committed relationship. Uh, couples may have children uh, and, and those children then again shift the dynamics of a, a relationship, but also that the type of change that happens in dementia is different. It's, it's often felt as a loss and it can be sad and it can be difficult and, and that's okay. Uh, second, we talk about the importance of pleasant activities scheduling as something that can uh, not only help to foster a continued relationship, but that we also know can help to reduce patient neuropsychiatric symptoms and reduce some of the negative consequences associated with dementia caregiving. So when we talk about pleasant activity scheduling, we help our caregivers to uh, think through what their loved one may have liked previously uh, and how that might uh, be compatible or incompatible with changing abilities uh, and maybe even changing interests. So, you know, it may be that the caregiver and person with dementia used to love to play these, you know, really engaging uh, games of Scrabble. N now, maybe they can, you know, just sort tiles uh, together. Uh, you know, they may have previously enjoyed having long conversations uh, about things, but, you know, now maybe things are more centered on activities like looking through old pictures or, or listening to, to music. Uh, we also tell caregivers that they will have to likely take the lead, that they'll have to plan these activities, uh, that they should plan ahead uh, rather than, you know, sort of winging it uh, to start small if they're gonna try to engage in a, a new activity or introduce uh, something new or something outside the home. 
to consider what time of day might be most appropriate for the person. When are they at their best? Uh, you know, it might be in the morning. It might be in the afternoon. Uh, you know, also to consider the time of day in terms of the temperature. So, you know, they may not want to leave the house in the middle of summer, you know, midday. Uh, you know, we talk about going going with the flow that things may not work out the way uh, that they had planned uh, to be in the moment. And then if they have to abandon the plan uh, and sort of shift uh, shift things, uh, that it's okay to do that and, you know, not to give up, to, to try again. And then, of course, I already talked about this last one that I uh, have sort of added to my, my mental list, you know, which is permission to stay at home, permission to, like, not do all, all the things. There are uh, some broad techniques that we talk to our uh, dementia caregivers about when we're helping them to manage problems. Some of these are things that you can talk about during feedback or uh, put in your recommendations or things uh, that you can consider if you have uh, longer relationships with dementia caregivers. So uh, individuals with dementia may have more difficulty, uh, we know, in everyday situations. They may feel more easily overwhelmed by noise or crowds or uh, scared and anxious more often. And sometimes just getting some reassurance from their caregiver can help to stop uh, behavior problems, you know, telling them that it's okay or that they're safe. It can also be helpful for caregivers to reconsider situations from the perspective of their loved one with dementia. Uh, this may uh, help to uh, problem solve how things can be uh, done in a different way. So, you know, for example, maybe a person with dementia gets agitated like every single time the visiting nurse comes to help with bathing. And a caregiver might wonder, like, why does this happen every time? Shouldn't my person be used to this by now? You know, this person's, you know, been coming for two months. But to the person with dementia, to reconsider things from their point of view, they may not remember that this happens every week for the last two months. And it may feel like every week a new person is coming to help with this very private task that the person might not even appreciate that they, they need help with. And so understanding that might, uh, you know, one, make it sort of easier emotionally to, to uh, appreciate where the behavior is coming from, but two, may actually help with practical problem solving. Um, we teach our caregivers to avoid simply telling the person with dementia to stop a behavior or like trying to reason with the person with dementia. You know, those things rarely work. Instead, we suggest that the caregiver redirect the person to another activity or a room, you know, point out something interesting, give them, give them something new to do. And then learning uh, some techniques to relax. So, you know, often the person with dementia will look to the caregiver to help them understand the situation and figure out how to behave. And if the caregiver is agitated and upset, chances are it will only make the person with dementia agitated and upset. So, you know, learning techniques to manage emotions and relax can be a, a very useful tool. Another broad technique is this three-time principle to improve communication with the person with dementia. So first, we tell caregivers, take your time. Don't tell the person with dementia information while you're rushing out the door. Don't wait until five minutes before you have to leave the house to start getting the person with dementia ready. Second, say and do one thing at a time. Speak slowly and clearly. Give one-step directions. Instead of saying, you know, go get dressed and grab your coat and bag so we can go, start with requesting the person get dressed, etc. Uh, and last, offer timely praise. Avoid criticism. Look for things to offer genuine praise for. You know, that can help the person with dementia feel more secure, valued, can reduce behavioral problems. Uh, in our clinic, we have programs that are a bit more in-depth, about 10 sessions to teach caregivers specific skills to manage behavior problems. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, most of you are familiar with the ABCs of uh, behavior, uh, this sort of technique that helps people uh, usually through the use of journals to track the antecedents and consequences of behaviors uh, so that these behavior uh, behavioral logs can be analyzed uh, with the clinician uh, and modifications can, can be made uh, in small uh, systematic ways in order to try to modify the, the behavior problem. Uh, so again, I think this is a tool to use if you have a bit more time to, to work with a dementia caregiver. 
Um, some of the things, I mean, this is not exhaustive, but just sort of throwing some things out there um, to help manage more common memory problems. Um, certainly for our individuals with more mild impairment, we always discuss memory aids. Uh, wandering is often a big issue where we talk about, you know, maybe simply just putting a stop sign on the door as a visual cue using, you know, locks and alarms, um, you know, making a plan for wandering. W what are you going to do? Maybe you can proactively tell the police station about your loved one, uh, provide identification jewelry or use GPS tracking devices. Um, again, you know, we uh, tell our caregivers not to fight false memories, to go with them. So, you know, if a loved one says, oh, I spent uh, all day with my mother, you know, don't say, well, don't you remember your mother died, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, that can be re-traumatizing and can uh, cause uh, an increase in uh, behavior problems. Um, uh, and then, you know, the fact that reminding people that they have memory problems uh, is, really, is really helpful. Uh, difficulties with word finding and comprehension can make it more difficult and frustrating for the person with dementia to communicate. Uh, we talked to our caregivers about having patience, speaking slowly. We, you know, we talked about the one thing at a time, uh, avoiding multiple questions or commands. Um, you know, making sure that they're checking uh, hearing. This could contribute to perceived memory difficulties or uh, perceived worsening of memory difficulties. Uh, the the use of pictures uh, to help uh, caregivers label cabinets, um, signs for, you know, the bathroom, uh, for example, for steps that the person needs to go through before they go to bed, you know, brushing their teeth, using the toilet, etc. Uh, and then, you know, capitalizing on the preservation of nonverbal and emotional communication uh, so that, you know, holding hands, uh, comfort and touch on the shoulder, uh, physical affection, uh, and, you know, sort of managing uh, one's own emotions as the person with dementia looks to the caregiver to understand uh, situations. Um, certainly, we always want to look for and treat anxiety and depression. Uh, we find that it's very useful to provide education about apathy versus depression to our families. Uh, so family mem members will often observe apathy and say, you know, I'm really concerned that, you know, my, my dad's depressed. Uh, how do you know he's depressed? Well, he sits around all day. He doesn't really uh, engage with anybody, you know, and then you turn to dad and you say, you know, are you sad? Do you feel depressed? And, you know, dad says, no, I'm, I'm totally fine. I don't feel depressed at all. Uh, and so, you know, sort of using the, the presence of sadness uh, as an indication uh, about apathy versus depression and providing the family with that education can help uh, families sort of plan uh, and also to help them uh, understand their loved one's presentation better. Uh, driving, of course, is a very big issue. Uh, so patients with very mild AD have accident rates similar to 16 to 19 year old drivers and we uh, let them drive. Uh, so so uh, often what we will recommend, uh, depending on you know, the level of impairment of our patients is for family members to ride as a passenger monthly to see if they feel comfortable riding with the patient driving. Uh, the Hartford Foundation and MIT Age Lab also has resources that include a, a checklist that family members can bring along with them while riding with their loved one uh, so that they can track particular behaviors that might raise concerns for driving safety. Uh, so I do uh, have embedded here a link to the Hartford Foundation and MIT Age Lab resources. These are brochures that you can get for free for your office that we hand out to families all the time. And they're very helpful for uh, jumpstarting some of these conversations uh, related to driving and driving cessation. Um, there is some literature that suggests that adult children are better reporters after uh, riding with, with their loved one uh, compared to spouses. Of course, driving evaluations are the gold standard. Uh, we have the ability to refer uh, to our VA for driving evaluations, uh, but there are uh, other resources like uh, AARP or rehabilitation hospitals where people may be able to secure formal driving evaluations. We do always want to consider other safety concerns like guns in the home, power tools in the home, uh, we recently had a patient that we were concerned about uh, because he was working as a, a carpenter uh, and using uh, some tools that uh, could cause uh, quite a bit of harm if he uh, misused them. Uh, think about kitchen safety, knives, appliances, 
uh, using, you know, the stove, any concerns about people leaving the stove on, uh, thinking about things, uh, interventions like removing knobs from the stove, using childproofing or other locks. Uh, and then there are occasions where we have to talk about abusive or threatening behavior. Our caregivers raise concerns about these types of behaviors. Uh, some of these behaviors might be able to be managed with uh, some of the techniques that we talked about, uh, employing things like soothing music, uh, but also that the caregiver may find themselves in a the position where they need to call family, uh, friends, or even uh, the police if they feel unsafe or remove themselves from the house in order to preserve their own safety. And we do work with families to plan for the future. Uh, we feel that families should be encouraged to include the individual as much as possible. And so we tell our families that conversations about future planning are best had early. These include things like decisions about where one might want to live if they need to be placed outside the home at some point, uh, decisions about driving. The MIT uh, Age Lab resources also include uh, a contract between family members and the person with dementia uh, around driving and what happens if your family one day thinks that you're not safe to drive. Uh, will you, you know, stop driving and, and sort of signing that contract and using some of their other tools to plan for, well, how, how will you get around if that happens? Uh, certainly financial and legal planning, uh, decisions about the end of life, you know, uh, who will be there, what's a good death, considering brain donation, considering uh, what the ceremony might look like, uh, and then, of course, planning for the future of the caregiver once their loved one, loved one passes. And it, it's often difficult for families to have these, uh, these conversations. Uh, so of course, there are some medical and legal issues uh, and financial uh, and legal issues like uh, creating a will and a living will and a healthcare proxy, uh, power of attorney, engaging in estate planning, uh, do not resuscitate orders. And typically we will refer patients and families to uh, el elder care attorneys or our social workers or geriatricians to really talk through the nuances of those, uh, of those issues. Um, we may also talk to our families about protecting their loved ones from scams and con artists uh, that, you know, there may be poor judgment that puts them at higher risk for, for these types of things. Uh, and then, you know, when people are thinking about uh, moving their loved one outside the home. There are uh, various options, continuing care retirement communities where somebody can actually uh, go in while they're normal. Uh, and then there are various levels of care in case somebody uh, ever has the need for a higher level of care, uh, assisted living facilities and, and nursing homes. Uh, we talk to families about, you know, transitioning people uh, slowly, their loved ones slowly into these new housing uh, facilities. But I think that one of the questions that we're often faced with uh, that families will ask us in our offices is, you know, how do I know it's time to move my person with dementia outside home? Ultimately, it's a personal decision and every family is different. And that's the first thing that I will uh, say to families. But there are some guidelines uh, that I provide to help family members reflect on when might be the time to consider another level of care. And this really involves a focus on safety of themselves uh, and others and their loved one. So, you know, things like, does your loved one leave the stove on? Is wandering a problem? You know, has there been an increase in falls or accidents or mobility needs? Are there problems with medication management? Uh, is physical violence and aggression a problem? Uh, is there increasing incontinence, sanitary issues, you know, poor diet, lack of social or cognitive stimulation? And does the caregiver themselves feel resentful and, and burnt out? Uh, I think I will skip this. We've talked about this in other slides. Uh, and then I just wanted to provide with uh, the last several slides here, many of the resources that we use because it really does take a village to help support our dementia caregivers. Uh, so these are you know, various uh, national resources that we will provide caregivers with. I, I will say we always refer to the local chapter of our Alzheimer's Association. Uh, they are extremely helpful. 
Uh, within the VA, we have specific uh, VA caregiver support programs. So for folks within a VA system, uh, the informational number is provided here. Uh, there's a program of general caregiver support where caregivers uh, can receive, you know, in-home services, respite care, et cetera, and then a program of comprehensive family assistance uh, where caregivers can receive uh, monetary compensation for, for providing care. Um, I've also included a link here to the Office of Rural Health website. This is a publicly available link, so this is a resource for everyone from the VA. Uh, there are a series of very helpful caregiver videos uh, on a number of topics that you can see here, improving communication in dementia, intimacy in dementia, preventing financial mismanagement, et cetera, uh, and then uh, VA-specific resources, really, um, this transportation uh, service locator. Uh, so again, uh, other resources available both uh, publicly uh, from the VA, uh, but also uh, civilian-facing uh, resources. So there's a Jerry Scholars website where there's online learning tools for professionals and family members. Uh, this Dementia Caregiver Survival Guide, uh, tips for caring, this, this is specific to a veteran with dementia, uh, uh, that uh, this was a resource created by some of my VA colleagues and uh, Dr. Uh, Natalia Edmonds, um, who also runs a civilian-facing uh, Dementia Care Blazers website that includes a podcast, uh, downloadable materials, uh, videos, uh, and then also uh, a, a survival guide for uh, civilian caregivers. Uh, again, the Jerry Scholars website has a number of different educational materials about assistance with activities of daily living, uh, safety tips, and, uh, and then a bunch of helpful uh, websites. Uh, November is the month every year to really uh, focus on our family caregivers. Uh, I think, uh, you know, around um, holidays is also a time to sort of speak with families about what it might mean to get their loved one uh, out with other family members. Uh, that may be an additional source of stress for families. Uh, here are additional resources. And then I just wanted to uh, wrap up by going uh, back to Joan and, and Donald. Uh, so for Joan, we really engaged in some individual support focused on the impact of uh, her uh, past relationship with her father, feelings of resentment, guilt, sadness, these uh, sort of old wounds. Um, we made a plan for self-care, uh, filling her cup, provided a number of resources to supplement the care that she was providing and reduce the burden of balancing caring for her family and her father. So she is, uh, you know, this sandwich generation uh, of caregivers, uh, providing education about apathy. The, uh, her father was not endorsing sadness. She was uh, worried about his depression, um, talking about pleasant activity scheduling as a way uh, to perhaps uh, repair uh, the relationship or um, promote a, a positive relationship moving forward. Things like looking at old photos, use of music, uh, making some plans to uh, help remove guns from the home, connecting her with resources, providing a, a downloadable survival guide, uh, and inviting her to join some of our, our group activities. Uh, and then for Donald, uh, really individual support focusing on the profound loss of his relationship with his wife, uh, referring him to mental health resources for additional emotional support. He was feeling depressed and had found prior mental health treatment helpful, introducing our four R's uh, and engaging him in focused practice outside of the sessions. Um, talking to him about the futility of challenging false claims. So uh, for Donald, uh, his wife would often talk about, you know, the fact that she was waiting for her deceased parents, and he felt like it was dishonest to go along with that, and so he would remind her that uh, her parents are deceased and not coming, and that, you know, really just uh, resulted in a lot of um, combativeness, uh, so, you know, processing his feelings related to dishonesty and um, sort of providing some education about not challenging false claims. Um, we applied some music and singing to assist with uh, helping his wife with bathing, uh, which actually worked quite, quite well. Uh, implemented a pleasant activity scheduling to replace activities they used to enjoy together uh, that he had missed. 
um, discussed and honored his fears of moving his wife to a higher level of care and really reviewed uh, and discussed, you know, when might he know uh, that it's the time uh, and then, you know, providing uh, all of our uh, resources, including the Alzheimer's Association men's uh, support group uh, and engaging him in some of our services uh, here, here at the VA. So that brings us to the end of my presentation, um, and I would be very happy to take any questions that folks might have. Thank you again so much, Dr. O'Connor, for um, just a wonderful lecture of such an important topic of how we can really care for our caregivers as well and that, that guidance that's needed as well. So thank you. Um, and for anyone who um, has any questions, feel free to place them in the Q&A. Um, and I will begin asking some questions. And so the first um, question that um, I have, and that's um, in the chat, is um, when you mentioned about the false memories, oftentimes, um, what happens and how can caregivers navigate those conversations when a false memory may be distressing? Um, and so how do you um, go about challenging it or just kind of navigating that? Um, yeah, so so I think um, what I would start with is uh, again sort of similar to to you know what I had mentioned about our work with Donald is explaining you know what a false memory is, um, uh, explaining that it is rarely helpful to challenge the false memory, and and I would really come from a place of trying to support the caregiver in learning how to redirect uh, their person with dementia uh, as, as sort of the first line intervention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. And then um, we have time for one last question. Um, and so this question is just considering um, the cultural context of the different patients that we work with. And so um, how do you and your clinic um, kind of incorporate um, those cultural considerations um, when you're working with different families and um, your patients and caregivers? Sure, so, so all of the caregiver work that we do here uh, starts with a standardized interview where we uh, ask questions about the family system, uh, the background and history of the relationship between the caregiver and the person with dementia. Uh, and then really importantly, uh, cultivating a good understanding of what the caregiver wants to accomplish in our work together. Uh, so that, you know, even if there are things that we think should be the target of an intervention, uh, we really are uh, focusing on, on what the caregiver wants uh, as the target of intervention. And, you know, so just uh, getting to know the the sort of family system from the perspective of the caregiver uh, is is you know I think um, really critical to providing a good sort of individualized care that takes into account the unique perspective and background of our caregivers. Yeah, well, thank you so much for for that, and that's very valuable, and it's really helpful as well too. So we thank you so much for. Um, spending your hour with us um, and providing us with a wonderful lecture um, of how we can, you know, really care for our caregivers and to be able to really care for our patients with dementia as well. So thank you so much, Dr. O'Connor. And so that ends our lecture. So thank you all for joining us um, today and we hope you have a good rest of your day. All right. Bye. Bye.